mystery of stuff. What is a dirty little or big secret about an industry that you have worked in that people outside the industry really ought to know? Starbucks corporate makes us have those recycling bins in the lobby to present this green image, but most of the time all of the garbage ends up going to the dump anyway because the facility doesn't have recycling. The only place I ever worked that actually sent shit to get recycled is when I had a temp job at a community college. At stores that magical backroom where you can just go and pick up anything is actually a huge mess where things go missing all the time. Just thought of this. While we have stuff in order of aisles even then it's not the most orderly. If it says one I say we have none unless I've seen it, or it's a big item. Businesses offer rebates rather than cash discounts because they know the odds of you going to the trouble of mailing in a rebate coupon are minimal. Then they don't pay the first time because they know the odds of you complaining about it are infinitesimal. But they usually will pay off if you complain. Half of technical support going on in the background of major platforms is convincing the developers to care about the issue enough to fix it. Also, every platform that interacts in any way with Facebook, hates Facebook. It's so fucking broken. I work with kids at a daycare, and we see babies take their first steps sometimes, but we never tell the parents because we don't want them to feel bad about missing it. Thank you. This happened to me and my first kid, and I didn't figure it out until years later. I picked my kid up from the gym daycare, and the lady asked if kid was walking yet. I said no and she said something like well she's standing real good, and so I take her home and tried to get her to walk and she does. So exciting. I didn't figure it out until years later. The official policy for customer dissatisfaction at a particular Canadian coffee franchise I worked at was, offer them free stuff until they stop complaining. Dude. That's most Qsomter service nowadays. No one wants to spend the time or money dealing and paying a Qsomter service rep to handle an irate customer. Just get them to shut up and keep moving so they can serve more people. The amount of toilet paper, random items, and bills used as bookmarks that are left in returned library books. Terrible and illegal things go on in every strip club. Owners only hire people for upper management who they have trusted for years because they all know this. My friend's wife was a stripper, and we used to go to all the local ones because they had friends at all of them. I got to hang out with the girls a lot, I am also a girl, and was in my 20s at this time, so they didn't mind letting me hang out backstage or wherever if it was slow. I admire their hustle, but holy shit I saw some craziness. What I experienced was mostly an escort situation being run on the side, and a good bit of drugs and sex going on in and outside some of the seedier clubs. When renting a storage unit you do not need to get the insurance they offer. Even if they say it's mandatory, it's illegal to force you to get insurance. Also the rent will increase yearly, forever. Edit, for those asking I'm in CA, rules are different state to state. This comment wasn't about how the insurance offered is a scam, or how your homeowner's insurance is far superior. From my experience any type of homeowner's or renter's insurance that people use for storage ends up screwing them. I just wanted people to be aware of the choices they have. Say no and walk out the door. If they really meant that mandatory, you'll have to find another storage locker. If they didn't which is more likely they'll call you back to complete the lease. The key, as in so many other things, is being willing to walk away. Funeral homes or businesses and funeral directors will absolutely take advantage of grieving people. The most offensive to me are the cremation boxes. They're literally just big cardboard boxes and should cost less than $100. But they also make really expensive boxes and directors will say things like grandma would be more comfortable in this. No, she won't because she's dead. Some of these boxes reach $1,000 and of course are all just burned. A used car is priced based on what it will sell that for, but the margin is calculated by how deep they are into it. So if a car was just traded in, and they haven't detailed it or advertised it yet you can pay thousands less if you ask.
And so e-car dealerships have reward systems based on numbers for the salesman and the dealer and management so if you are there at the end of the month you can sometimes get a screaming good deal because even at zero profit, the sale bumps them up to a big bonus. What's a non-obvious sign that somebody is wealthy? Mystery of stuff. Didn't realize how wealthy some casual acquaintances were until we were at a nicer bar at a resort, and as soon as the staff saw their credit card they started getting really really good service. It was a nice place and they were great to everyone, but suddenly this couple were like the only ones on the room. So apparently the color of your credit card which I don't think is always a giveaway, but people in some industries just probably know rich person credit cards. I have a Sally Mae student loan cash back card and that didn't get me anything. Many super high-end cards are heavy. I'm talking it's made of metal kind of heavy. It's pretty obvious. Back in my college days we had a friend who came from a pretty wealthy family, but you couldn't tell because he lived in the dorms like everyone else. Except anytime someone suggested we go to a restaurant or to a game or show he never asked about how much it cost or said he'd have to check his bank account like other people would say. Then one day he casually mentioned his father was going to bring him back to campus in their helicopter. A professor friend of mine asked a student if she needed an extension because she had to make an emergency trip home to Europe. She replied that it wasn't an emergency, her parents just wanted to see her, and that it wasn't that inconvenient, they sent the family jet to pick her up from her pretty rural school. Went to college with a guy like this. He was pretty low-key but would always have money when he needed it. Someone hit his car in the parking lot and he had a new one the next week. Someone stole his golf clubs, he was on the golf team, and he drove to the pro shop and dropped $2,500 on a set while he waited for his custom clubs to be sent to him. That sort of thing. Spend money to save time versus spending time to save money. Thanks for the gold. I hope it saved you some time. Had a roommate in first year who rarely lived in the dorm, but had food delivered daily that tasted like it was picked out and cooked the same morning. Well we invite him to St. Patty's Day, and I notice his watch to which I drop a that's really cool, mind I see it, half drunk. I saw the watch face and asked him about the symbol. Mind you this watch was really heavy as I am holding it, and he says it's the family sigil. I was holding a 23k gold watch, and he turned out to be part of the Qatari royal family. Dude could easily stunt on any one one of us. So I guess it's the small things in their lifestyle, and how modestly someone can wear 100,000 US dollars on their wrist. I went to university with two girls from Qatar. They seemed all normal like the rest of us until we found out that they each had a maid escorting them abroad for the duration of their studies. They rarely or never talk about money in everyday conversations. There's a saying that there's an inverse correlation between how wealthy someone is and how often they mention money, but it's not that easy or obvious to gauge how often someone actually talks about money without interacting with them a lot. From what I've learned, if they dress like the Monopoly man and wear a monocle they're pretending to be rich. The actual rich folk wear subtle high-quality clothing or look homeless. They don't flaunt it, don't talk about money, and never complain about money problems. Their kids have no pressure to get regular, middle-class jobs. Some families I know have three to four kids, and are very proud this one is an artist, that one is 40 and getting a PhD, the other acts and directs local theater. It's a subtle status symbol to support your kid in whatever. I have a minor panic attack how does that pay the bills? But it doesn't have to. I don't see a lot of designer purses or granite countertops, but a lot of art and every piece, there's an accompanying story about being in that country, or knowing that artist, that artist stayed in their house, etc. I work at a luxury car dealership, so I see my fair share of wealthy people. The one thing that stands out between them and regular people is how carefree and nice they are. I crashed a lady's car once, pretty badly, and all she did was laugh and say, the important thing is that you're not hurt. I was astonished, since I'm used to my mom being so frantic and, frankly, abusive to employees if even the slightest thing is wrong. They don't take pictures with cash in their hands and put it on Instagram. 
If you live in Silicon Valley, you won't be able to spot the poor from the rich. You can have a millionaire walk next to you in Target pants and drive a Honda. What was the worst, most damaging, way you took revenge? Mystery of stuff. A neighbor who I never met accused me of trying to stab her dog through a double fence this winter. They have a wooden six-foot stockade fence surrounded by a four-foot chain-link fence. The dog was injured on something in their backyard and required several stitches which resulted in a large vet bill that they couldn't afford. They concocted the story that their animal-hating neighbor did this and began a fundraiser and raised quite a sum of money, way more than the bill was. I had no idea about this whole drama until a friend in the police department told me of what this wacko was accusing me of. So once I found out, I requested a copy of the police report where the neighbor stated that the dog was hurt in their yard, there wasn't any blood or human footprints near the fence etc etc, and I posted it to the fundraising site. She lost friends and reputation for $400. Not exactly the worst revenge, but I think it's funny. My ex-mother-in-law was one of those a wife serves her husband and does everything kind of people. She always criticized me. My housework, the meals I cooked etc. I decided to get even by filling a sock with the dust from my vacuum canister. Every day I'd stop by her house and take a moment to shake the sock around her house. It left dust everywhere. The floors were the easiest. Everyone's socks would get dirty from walking around. Her husband was noticing she wasn't doing her duty. The best was when I went and shook dust all over her couch pillows and returned that night. I made a show of flopping down on the couch from being so exhausted from work. Dust went everywhere. Her husband was like what the hell, don't you ever vacuum? This is brilliant. I imagine you shaking and swinging your sock full of dust like a priest with a branch sprinkling holy water. Bless this carpet with vengeance. This is my dad's story from when he was a kid. He was walking down the road one day when a bunch of kids in their late teens pulled up in a car and sprayed him with a fire extinguisher. He blew it off as a joke and thought it was pretty funny. Five minutes later the same kids circle around and spray him a second time. This time my dad took note of the license plate number make and model of the car and proceeded to track it down and find out where the kid lived. That night he went to the kid's house and threw a fire extinguisher through the car's windshield. Justice was served. I screen capped photos from my wife's lover's Facebook and sent them to the school administration because he was a teacher and posting pics of your students' tests and making fun of them is not cool at all. He was fired at the end of the year. Edit, after his dismissal, I divorced her and got her removed from her position at a daycare because it was a church-based facility with morality clauses for employment. All it took was a conversation with the pastor and she was phased out at the first available opportunity. A buddy of mine insulted me, so I got him drunk, took him down to the family catacombs, chained him to a wall inside an alcove, and bricked up the front of the alcove. No regrets. So everyone has heard of the classic X-Lax and the brownies trick right? Well my buddy pulled that weak sauce on me about a week ago, so I pulled this little ditty on him to show him just how much more worse it can get. So there is this awesome weight loss drug called Ali, which works by turning off the enzymes that digest ingested fats, so instead of being absorbed through the gut they are instead passed right through the GI tract. Well I took said buddy out to a truce dinner at the local Asian buffet, pretty much fat covered fat in fat, and slipped him a dose mid-meal. The amount of raw sludge that has dripped, sloshed, and exploded out of that undeserving slash deserving asshole is more revenge than I could ever hope for. I worked in an office once, and the boss was a real prick. If you used any of your sick days, he would hold that against you at your yearly review, but if he was sick at all, or even just felt like it, he would stay home or go golfing. Well, there was a terrible flu going around. I was sick, a co-worker was sick and throwing up in his trash bin, but none of us were allowed to leave. So when my boss went home super early, again, I went into his office and coughed and sneezed all over his mouse and keyboard. He got really sick a day later. In sixth grade, some kid made a snide remark in class about my name, and the whole class laughed. 
I saw him in the hallway carrying books the next day, so I kicked the back of his knee. The sound of teeth on linoleum still fills the spaces between my thoughts. What's a deeply unsettling fact? Mystery of stuff. These answers will be lifted and reposted online as a clickbait article, making money off other people's writing for almost no effort. If you become an astronaut and are in the ISS when an apocalyptic asteroid hits, you could be among the last few humans left alive, with a limited oxygen supply, limited food supplies, and no external assistance in returning home or surviving. If you are a certain distance from a nuclear explosion, you won't be killed immediately, but instead, you'll get third-degree burns throughout your entire body. This kills your nerves so fast that it's completely painless. I test schools water for lead. Millions of children across the United States, many people here included, are being exposed to absurdly high levels of lead. This leads to behavior and learning problems, lower IQ, hyperactivity, slowed growth, hearing problems, and anemia. If not for yourself, for the sake of your children, please use filters at home. For example, a few years back I was leaving a friend's house party and was about to head out the door when I realized I couldn't find my keys. Took about three or four minutes to find before I went on my way. Fast forward just a few miles down the road there is a huge pileup of cars and wreckage with no cops or ambulance on the scene yet. Once I got out and went to talk to some involved and help out, they mentioned that the crash happened only a few minutes ago. Really makes you think. Like my mama always said, a problem that's already decaying isn't actually a problem. Lovely woman. Died to gamma radiation from nuclear waste. You may never know if you've gone insane. Scarier still, patients with Alzheimer's have lucid days when they realize how much of their mind they've lost. Some break down in tears and ask for their loved ones to kill them. The entire universe outside our galaxy could have completely disappeared over 20,000 years ago, and we still wouldn't know it yet. Our view of the universe is actually what it looked like anywhere from thousands to billions of years ago with no way to see what it actually looks like right now. Imagine if you looked out your front window and saw your yard as it was six months ago, neighbor's house across the street a year ago, and houses a block or two away as they were several years ago. Also off in the distance you see the glaciers from the last ice age. That's what it's like looking out at the universe. Or that if they weren't extinct and we could communicate. We would just constantly be reintroducing ourselves. This is because the amount of time it takes to send a signal there and back would be such a long time that our culture and our governments would have completely changed by then. So it would be like hi, I am Joe and I am the president of the United Earth. Then you hear a response from the alien civilization, and then our reply would be, Hi, I am Bob, and I am the supreme ruler of Earth and these people are all my slaves. There are a huge amount of illnesses that aren't curable or even treatable. We have this idea that we go to a doctor, they find out what's wrong with us, and then fix us. There are many illnesses that make doctors throw up their hands because they don't even know what is causing us to be unwell, and people are often ill for years or life. The first firefighter killed responding to the 9-11 attacks was struck dead in the courtyard by a falling body. Two people killed simultaneously one on his way in, the other on their way out. Also, to this point, the fact that people are still dying from 9-11 and its after effects. My father-in-law passed this weekend and he was a first responder. His heart failed after his lungs could no longer get oxygen to his blood. At some point in the future one user in this thread will be alive and everyone else will be dead. Once I said hi to my neighbor and she replied with like hi hi and she walked 50m further and hit by a car. You never know how random and to how random people your last words will be. I wouldn't want my last words to be add me some mayonnaise to that darling. Serial killers have been known to keep captured victims alive for years or even decades. For those of you with children, you only have about 1,000 weekends with them before they are adults. What historical fact blows your mind? Mystery of stuff. 
London Underground opened during the American Civil War. That at the same time the US Civil War was going on, which killed about 600,000 people and served as probably our greatest national tragedy, China was in the throes of the Taiping Rebellion. The Taiping Rebellion is the largest civil conflict in human history, and best estimates put the death toll somewhere north of 20 million. Really reminds you of just how many more people live in Asia. The number of aircraft destroyed during World War II is greater than the number of aircraft that currently exist in the entire world today. In the late 1800s, writers complained that young adults are losing touch with reality, instead of sitting at the dinner table with family they have their noses buried in a magazine. In the late 1800s, music paper producers claimed that illegally copying sheet music would destroy the entire music industry. In one of my history classes, I read about Italians in the 1300s complaining that the younger generation was lazy, entitled, didn't know the value of hard work, and used too much slang. Since then I just stopped listening to anyone saying that today, and will hopefully not say that about the younglings when I'm older. After being shot during a duel, Andrew Jackson lived with a bullet next to his heart for 39 years. Edit, as a fellow Redditor pointed out, Jackson was shot first and calmly kept his composure and ended up killing the man. When speaking to an astonished friend after the incident he stated, If he had shot me through the brain, sir, I should still have killed him. How deplorable the conditions were just being in the Royal Navy in the 17th century. You would work in disgusting, stupidly dangerous conditions, had more than a 50% chance of dying and after three years of this they would find an excuse not to pay you at all. This is why a lot of them became pirates. There was a saying that the only difference between prison and the navy is that in the navy you might drown too. That the Romans and the Chinese knew about each other and actually communicated semi-regularly. It is believed that the human population dipped as low as 1,000 people about 70,000 BCE. We could very well have been a few stillbirths or saber-tooth maulings away from extinction. When reduced to such low numbers, the survival of a species truly teeters on a knife's edge. It's a difference of a handful of births. Too few and you dip below minimum viable population. Our survival could have come down to something as trivial as some tribe finding a spring or gazelle in the nick of time. Yes, it's thought that extremes of climate in eastern Africa forced humans to divide into small, isolated groups. We came back from the brink, reunited, and populated the world. Shit's crazy. Epcot, the entire theme park at Walt Disney World, was built in three years. It takes longer to get new shopping plazas finished today. Largest construction job in the world at the time. Just learned this in my history class today. There are no more living veterans of World War I, but there are still 20,000 alive widows of World War I veterans. It's estimated that Genghis Khan killed approximately 40 million people in his lifetime. It's also estimated that when he slaughtered the city of Urgench, he killed over a million people in approximately six months. That the Roman Empire existed for over 2,000 years in one form or another, and there were people calling themselves Romans until the 1800. Pluto didn't even get to complete one orbit around the sun between the time it was discovered and the time it was declassified as a planet. Alexander the Great defeated Darius II of the Persian Empire, the largest empire in the world at the time, by meeting them in the field in open combat. And he did it twice. In the first battle, he was outnumbered 7 to 1. In the second battle, he was outnumbered 10 to 1. And he fucking decimated the Persians. Persian leader Cambyses II used cats to defeat an Egyptian army. He had his soldiers paint cats on their shields and brought hundreds of cats and other animals that the Egyptians held sacred to the front lines. The Egyptians refused to fight the cat army and were easily defeated because of it. Not only did John Adams and Thomas Jefferson die within hours of one another, it was on July 4 the 50th anniversary of the adoption of the Declaration of Independence. People who legally died for a few minutes and came back, what was it like? Mystery of Stuff Hey there! 
I've actually died twice. Crazy premature birth, heart and lungs didn't work great, and it took a mess of wacky science to bring me back. But I was too young then to remember anything obviously, so that doesn't super count. Second time, I was 19 and got clobbered by a drunk driver. I remember seeing the truck coming up behind me, so I moved to the other side of the road, and then wham. About two to three seconds of pain and chaos and fear. Apparently I managed to find my phone and one of my shoes, then called for help. My jaw was shattered but I was just screaming and they GPSed me, but I have no memory of that. My next memory, after the brief shock of being struck, was the paramedic cutting a trach. You wanna know what that's like? It's like if your sleep paralysis demon finally catches up to you. Then the next memory is waking up a week later, with a half dozen tubes plugged into me, thrashing and screaming and crying like it had just happened. No biblical dreams, no light at the end of the tunnel. Just chilling to some music on a walk dash being flung into a tree dash having my throat cut open dash waking up a week later in a matter of seconds. 0 slash 10 wouldn't recommend, except I firmly lost any faith I had in an afterlife, and it caused a huge rift in my very religious family. Tell me more about what happens when you die, mom. I'd love to hear your theories. No offense at all, I never mind answering questions. I was never legally pronounced dead. My heart and lungs stopped doing their jobs for a while, full arrest, which is typically considered you know, not alive. There was nothing going on, the machine was broken. I didn't mean to give the impression that a doctor pronounced me dead, and I miraculously sprang up again or something. Working in a hospital and taking care of people who have been legally dead and have come back either on their own accord or with CPR, I've heard these people say that they felt like they were falling. They also wake up really confused not remembering the situation. To me it seems like what they experience is close to a dream that you're falling and wake up with a jolt. A friend of mine had an overdose caused a stroke and legally died for a little under three minutes in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. He remembers the stroke and being wheeled to the ambulance on a stretcher. Then he felt like he was floating under ice-cold water, and it was dark, but he wasn't really thinking or feeling anything emotionally, just existing and knowing it was very very cold and he couldn't see. Then he woke up and the EMTs were kind of freaked out because his heart had stopped long enough that they figured he was done. At some point in the following days he became convinced that what he experienced was hell minus the knowledge of suffering, like a toned-down preview, and thought it was a warning for him to change his life. Sadly he didn't stay clean for long. That goes to show you the power of addiction. It's absolutely crazy the grasp it can have on people, and the crazy shit it can make them do to get their next fix. It's also extremely shitty to see people who deteriorate into the depths of addiction. None of these people didn't start out that way. Failed suicide attempt. When I was being resuscitated by dad after he found me hanging, in my dream I woke up in the water, I was looking around and just acknowledged my surroundings, by the time my brain processed where I was I realized I was drowning. I looked down it was pitch black, looked up, and swam for my life, it felt like I was running out of oxygen, just as I hit the top, I woke up and was being put into the ambulance, feel asleep again then woke up later in ICU. Was 10 plus years ago. When I was a kid I contracted dengue fever. Majar killer of kids my age. So while I wad hemorrhaging blood the crackhead doctors told my parents I had to have an appendix removal. They put me under but realized something was wrong when I didn't wake up for 48 hours later. During that time I had a hell of a dream was walking on a beach and there was a dude cloaked in black sitting on a bench. Had a nice chat with him before walking up. It was world of gray and occasional bright color. I was sitting on table and listening to people around me. Their voices were muffled. Then it hit me. I could not move. With corner of my eye I saw a black figure sitting no more than two meters from me. I felt fear and could not move. Then I woke up. Eyes full of blood. Sharp pain. Etc. I remember getting in the ambulance and I remember getting out. Was completely unaware that I had arrested until I was told some days later.
Redditors who went to school with a celebrity, what were they like before they became rich and famous? Mystery of Stuff Franca Bagnail is my dad's cousin. We were at a family wedding and he was telling us, yeah, they're making a movie about my life. Leonardo DiCaprio is playing me. He's a professional liar, so we all just laughed at him. Then catch me if you can came out. It really isn't too hard, just a few weeks of watching how you speak and it'll become habit. Just pause instead of saying them if you need to think of what you want to say next. That was something a HS teacher taught me. Just watch out because if you're not careful other filler words will replace them eventually. Zac Efron went to a neighboring high school. He dated a girl from my school for a while, I remember him coming to some school dances. My wife was also in his grade at his school. He was a bit nerdy, but a nice guy. Pretty much just a normal dude from nowhere that ended up mega famous. My dad went to school with Vanilla Ice, he said he was nice. I went to high school with Hayden Christensen before he was in Star Wars. He was artsy and seemed shy. Spent his time in the drama department and was a nice guy from every memory I have. Cool, a topic I can contribute to. Went to high school with John Legend. He was a year older than me. He was clearly very talented, lead role in most school plays, musical acts at talent shows etc. But he was basically just a really nice, humble guy. I wasn't friends with him, but I was an athlete who hung out with the theater crowd. I helped on set construction and sound for shows. He was a basketball fan and came to most of our school's games. His cousin was also on the team and a year younger than me. Went to middle school with Raven Simone, post Cosby, pre that so Raven. She was just a normal kid, but if you asked for an autograph slash made a big deal about her you got detention. In the words of my year 12 classics teacher, Kylie Minogue was really smart and lovely. Danny Minogue was just lovely. I went to Northwestern W. David Schwimmer. He lived with my best friend in a house after graduating. He's an outstanding actor with a huge range only actor ever to make me tear up in the middle of a play. Too bad he's been so typecast now. Nice guy. My high school theater director knew David Schwimmer, so we were able to acquire the rights to perform his play Trust at our school. He even came to one of the performances. I wasn't in the play, but I did set construction. Unfortunately, I wasn't at the performance he came to. My uncle went to the same high school as Brittany and Jamie Lynn Spears. He rode the bus with Jamie Lynn because they both lived in Kentwood, La, but went to school in Mississippi. Apparently on the bus Jamie would hand out CDs of Britney's music when she was first getting started with music. Also one day he saw her crying on the bus because people were calling Britney a slut. LOL I pretty sure he hung out her house one time too, I think their parents were friends. My cousins and I used to beg him tell us stories about Britney. My grandma went to the same high school as James Dean. Said he was chill and charismatic. Was kinda cocky as a result though because he knew he was hot stuff. My dad used to be a punk drummer in California. New Green Day when they were first starting out. He said the band mates were cool but the lead singer was a potty bitch that would often cancel or storm off if people he didn't like were at concerts slash parties. Didn't have thick skin when it came to some criticism either. Tom Hanks was in this Midwestern theater troupe, way before he got famous, that visited my mom's high school. I believe it was a specific workshop for the school's theater department, where the students got to work with the visiting actors. She and her friend both thought he was the best one in the troupe, and also thought he was insanely nice. Edit, this was in Doylestown, Ohio if anyone's curious. Not a super famous connection, but Avril Lavigne, Canadian musician, was the bat girl for my baseball team. She was a cute kid and respectful, it was years later when she had a hit song that I realized it was actually her. Mom knew R. Kelly and was even in the video Summer Bunnies, but very hard to spot out, but she's in there. She said he was dating her friend and always made fun of him. 
She also knew Common and has her as a friend on her private Facebook. They still take from time to time. My dad is not amused. People who were asked, sell me this pen during a job interview, how did you answer? Mystery of stuff. Not me, but a former sales manager was a douchebag who prided himself on being the greatest and the only one who knew everything about sales and tech, he didn't, hence the word former. He was trying to find a new salesperson, but rejected nearly every resume I put in front of him for nitpicky bullshit until one day he announced that he'd found the perfect candidate and was bringing him in for a formal interview, but he was pretty sure he was going to hire him on the spot. He kept going on and on about how this guy was perfect and why couldn't we find him someone like this and blah blah blah. Whatever, fine, just get it done. He bought the guy in, sat him down and said sell me this pen. The guy picked up the pen, handed it back, and said I don't play pen games. Then he walked out, and we never heard or saw him again. Would you really hire somebody who charges you 50 quid for a pen that was already yours to begin with? 50 quid? Alright, 30 for you. Deal? I did this once. I didn't take it seriously at all since it was for selling advertising on the 8th ranked country station in a small liberal town. Instead of selling the guy a pen, I got him interested in buying a pontoon boat, as he mentioned having a base boat earlier in the interview. He was like, sell me this pen, and I said, why? Are you in the market for a pen right now? Is that a problem you're having a hard time solving yourself? And then we started talking about free time and hobbies. It totally worked, and I don't know how and I also didn't care because that job sucked. This made me laugh so hard because I had this sell me the pen question presented to me in an interview to sell ads on the local talk radio station that was by far the lowest ranked station in the region. I said something like everybody wants to rely on their Palm Pilot to keep organized, but what if you drop it in the river? You're gonna need a go anywhere, compact, dependable pen as a backup. This was a very pontoon slash base boat heavy area, so it seemed to really hit home. Everyone has dropped something in the river. Cheers to an oddly similar experience. That job sucked so bad. Any item you drop in the river is useless really. What you actually need is this fishing net, $200. I asked may I see it? I then put it in my pocket. He asked for the pen back, and I tried to charge him 10 pounds for it. I didn't get the job or get to keep the pen. Stood up and fucked off out of there. It was a job for truck driving. What a cunt. Edit. Thank you for the silver award kind stranger. My first award, I am indeed honored. Right. I've been asked this question in warehouse and administrative work. If a job ad gives the faintest hint of sales being involved, I have absolutely no interest in it. Yet this question still gets used. I heard it being asked at a group interview by the new lady from HR. I shot her a WTF look she asked a different question instead. I would tell them that I had already created a website to purchase pens called Pen Island. And would encourage them to visit penisland.com. Not quite the same but I was filling out an application for a job once when the owner came back where I was and said if you can name the song on the radio right now, you can have the job. I was able to name it and started at 5 that night. I was once at a job fair where this wasn't even attached to an interview, it was more like an open mic night kind of thing. I skipped it. Edit, on another job, a customer told me that my describing my dislike of upselling was a bonding experience with the customer who doesn't want to be upsold, and thus a really slick sales tactic. He didn't seem mad. So, either sales is really 12th dimensional zen chess, and I accidentally made a good play, or he was just messing with me. I don't know. I had a customer tell me he would never hire me for a sales job but he wanted my card because he didn't want to work with any other salesperson. Huge fucking ego on that guy who thought he'd mastered 4D chess. And while I do take pride in not being into snake oil bullshit, even if that's just some psychological rationalization in my head because I'm bad at it, Fucko probably didn't even notice I'd sold him high-margin accessories and the warranty plan. 
From my employer's perspective, it was the perfect sale. I asked them why. You already bought it. They told me I had to prove my salesmanship skills. So I said why? You already paid for it. Clearly the product speaks for itself. Just like our product does. I got the job. But it turns out I was actually interviewing to be a janitor, and they got me confused with someone else. Police officers of Reddit, who's the smartest criminal you've ever encountered? Mystery of stuff. A guy I went to high school had been stealing from Walmart in a pretty clever way. He would grab video games, MP3 players, beer etc. and throw them away in a trash can in the garden section. The workers never checked the trash contents, and he would just wait, sometimes five hours until they emptied the trash in the back dumpster and hop in to get his items. Once he took a cardboard box from a display inside, filled it with video games, a PS3, and extra controllers. He grabbed some tape and pans and drew all over the box and taped it up to make it look used and tossed it. An hour later he had a whole new PS3 and stack of games. I heard about one person that pulled a shoplifting scam on a large, popular, and well-known US retail store. They walked in with some cheap nylon product to get one of those I walked in with the stickers they used to put on returning merchandise. The sticker easily peeled off the product undamaged. They walked to the electronics department, grabbed an expensive box off the shelf, and went to customer service. They placed the sticker on the big box and asked if they could return the item without a receipt. Unfortunately, no. Not without the original receipt. Dang it, and they walk out. Customer service even gave the doorman the thumbs up having just interacted with the customer. This took place before widespread inventory controls and cameras absolutely everywhere. Working in a home improvement store when younger. This guy came in, went to the snow blowers, took one and went to the return desk. Said he wanted to return it, but had no receipt. They told him you need a receipt so he says okay, I'll be back, and wheels it off to car through the front door. He did this a few times apparently. Couple places even helped him load it back into his car. A French thief who spent 10 years in prison became a comedian when he got out. One of his stories. Finds a building, goes in, chooses a floor and transforms the exit door into an extra apartment. Puts the apartment number, fake lock, welcome rug, etc. Puts an iPhone for sale. The person comes to buy it, he opens the door in a shower robe, and says give me one second, I'm just gonna count the money, and poof. He's gone from the exit stairs. Same thing as the computer rooms, guys would cut the power to electrical stations damage the wiring then hide waiting for the cops to show up. Once the owners of the buildings came they would shut off the power, because of the unsafe wiring that would have to be repaired in the morning. Everyone would leave for the night, then then would cut away all the non-powered wiring to get the copper. Not a cop. We got called for a roll over car accident. We get there and the car is empty so we think he got ejected. My partner and I start looking for a body nearby. A few minutes later a cop tells us that they think the driver is a mile down the road walking. We go check on him and he tells us he's fine, but he wasn't driving the car. He also didn't know who was driving the car, and he had clearly been drinking. During the ride to the ER, he told me that as long as the cops don't find you and in the car, the local DA won't pursue drunk driving charges. All you had to do was get out of the car and walk away from it. I remember getting into a festival and seeing a magician guy do tricks on the people searching him to distract them from the drugs he had on him. Spectacular show, and I'm sure he made good profit. If the police officers knew, they'd be talking about it on here. But I doubt it. Not a police officer, but I once dealt with a criminal who forged court documents facilitating his own release from prison. Edit, wow, my first silver. Thank you, kind stranger. Edit, oh my goodness, thank you for the gold. My first silver and my first gold in one day. Homeless guy in my hometown figured out if he committed some act of petty theft he'd get a night in jail, a warm place to sleep and a hot meal. 
he'd show up, turn in his stolen goods, and that would be that. After a while the police would just tell him to take back whatever he stole the next day. Quite the town character. Not a policeman but several years ago in Cape Coral, Florida, a man waited on a sidewalk in front of a Publix grocery store and used a taser on an armored car guard carrying two bags of money. A getaway driver in a car with stolen tags pulled up, taser guy and money bags get in, and they took off. Never caught. When I first moved to the area in the 90s, a man robbed a bank, jumped on a bicycle that he rode down a footpath through some woods, where he had left a boat on a waterway. Never caught. People sentenced in the 80s to 2000s what modern world change shocked you the most? Mystery of Stuff I knew a guy who was in prison from about 1999 or 2000 for about 12 to 13 years. When he got out he did a few odd jobs for my family, my mom was friends with his parents and was helping him earn money for stuff like mowing the lawn and cleaning etc. While he was over we found that he had no idea how to use Google, how to find a phone number in his phone contacts and barely knew how to send a text message. We helped him out with a few of those skills, but lost touch a while later. I'm not sure where he is these days. I remember helping a guy who went in in 2005. Got released 2014. Had a black and green AudioVox phone in his effects and asked where he could activate it. I had to explain that it wouldn't be happening lol. Like three months later, you know, I like the iPhone, but I'm gonna wait for the release of the newest one. Adapted pretty quick. I mean, you would. When I first saw the My Real smartphone, the iPhone 3GS, back in 2008, I didn't freak out and think it was magic or anything. It was really fucking cool and I had one within a few months, but still. If he went away in 2005 he probably knew the Blackberry was a thing. No matter what year you go in when you come out and stand on carpet for the first time is the most disturbing feeling. There was the documentary of someone who was sentenced in the 70s, Otis I think, and he just couldn't believe the stuff he was seeing, since he lived in New York, with all the screens it was just a different city than all the different colored drinks and people wearing earphones like they were in the secret service. It's an interesting thing to watch. I hired a guy that was released after 17 years, circa 2005. A week after he started working he bought a phone. He had a childlike wonder with push to talk and texting. A week later he was pissed off that he couldn't text his order into Hungry Howie's. I remember getting the bus years ago, and this old bloke got on heading away from town center towards the more residential areas. Without a second thought he sparked up a cigar, one of the passengers told him you can't smoke on a bus. He apologized and quickly stubbed it out, but said he got discharged from prison that day, and when he went in you could smoke anywhere you wanted so this was a massive culture shock to him. A co-worker a few years ago had spent 10 years in jail. He got out right when Bluetooth headsets for phones were huge. He'd talk about all the random conversations he thought people were trying to have with him, and smartphones freaked him the hell out. My uncle went away when fanny packs were in, and when he got out in the mid-2000s we had to break the news to him. Knew a guy who was blown away by digital cameras. He had purchased an old, terrible one and couldn't get over how amazing it was. Prisoner transfer I did one time for this man who was sentenced to life in 1968, and it's the first time he'd driven past the CN Tower in Toronto, and he couldn't believe how tall it was. That and he was blown away by how many different car brands there were. Got a call from a woman filing a claim on some abandoned funds. I got all her information and then asked for an email address and she said what's email? I keep hearing about it, but you gotta understand I've been in prison a long time. I'm honestly surprised there aren't mandatory classes in prison that help keep people up to date on current events and technologies. It would go a long way to help ex-cons function normally in society once they get out, and isn't that the whole goal of the prison system? My cousin's husband, that she married while he was serving 10 years beginning around 2008, wanted the first thing he did as a free man was to go to Hollywood Video and rent movies to watch with her. Then she blew his mind with Netflix. 
At least the idea of Netflix and chill wasn't far from his original plan, but he was shocked about there not being video stores anymore. Not me, but my father. I remember him trying to flip a CD upside down and put it back into the CD player like you would do with a record because it was skipping. Didn't notice how much of a big deal that must have been to him at the time. Adjusting to life on the outside can be really tough. I was talking to a lady who runs the education for a federal prison in Florida. She said when they start getting rambunctious or off-topic, she mentions a new feature of the newest iPhone and all of a sudden they're very interested in what she has to say again. A friend said his dad's friend tried VR after about 30 years in prison for like second-degree murder or something, and he got scared, fell over, and broke the headset. What is the most effective psychological trick you use? Mystery of Stuff One that I picked up from a friend of mine whenever he was trying to pick out dinner with his GF, rather than ask what do you want, and getting the typical I dunno, anything answer, and then having suggestions shot down. Start with what do you not want. Used it a few times in some of my relationships, and it's the godsend question. I work front desk in a medical office. Patients hate updating their paperwork. I used to say, look through the pages and make any changes. They would groan and reluctantly take the paperwork or just complain about it. Now I say, all you have to do is make changes. Saying it that way makes them think it's not much to do, and they take the clipboard without complaint. It's the little things that make life at my office easier. Saying hello to everybody you know, and with a smile. Often people who know each other from when they were in primary school, or just from the block when they were young give each other an awkward smile instead of an happy good day. Just imagine, if someone walks into you twice a year and both times you smile and greet them enthusiastically, they will think of you as a nice person. So little effort for a person to find you friendly. This isn't something I've used, but I think it's worth sharing. Darren Brown said that once there was a muscly drunk guy that wanted to beat him up and said the classic what are you looking at? Darren replied with the wall outside my house is 4 feet tall. The idea is that it puts the aggravated person on the back foot and takes them out of that adrenaline filled state. Anyways he sat down and the guy started crying to him about his GF. He is Darren Brown though so I wouldn't recommend this to everyone. IDK if this is an actual thing or not, or maybe just distractions, but when I do something annoying or bothersome to my husband and he goes quiet, I wait a few minutes and then I ask him a seemingly innocent question, usually on the subject of how certain parts of a car works or something mechanical. This gets him talking about the car thing and he rambles for like 5 minutes and then bam! He's happy again and not quietly brooding. I'll never tell him I do that because I'm afraid it won't work anymore if he knows about it. It's foolproof though, it works every single time, no matter how bothered he is. I'm a professional poker player. When I am in a pot with one other player, I often try to make them laugh when they are thinking about what to do. If you can get them to laugh, it sets them in a mood where they are unlikely to bluff. I talk a lot in general it's very common to make jokes at the table even in hands, my wife calls this the simplest most manipulative thing I do. Whenever I bump into an acquaintance, meaning not friend, just a person I know, I of course say hi and the conversation goes like this. Me, hey. How are you name? You look good. Them, laugh thank you, I'm good how are you? Me, I'm great, I'm on the way to wherever I am going to at the time and I tell them why too. So what are you doing here? Them, go into same detail to tell me where they're going and why. Me, alright, well I won't keep you up any longer than I have, have a good day name. It leaves people feeling good, takes away the awkwardness of cutting a convo short, and it makes them want to leave. If someone says they have the hiccups, ask them to prove it. Nine tenths times, their hiccups will disappear. Having to summon a hiccup in order to demonstrate will trick your diaphragm into just not hiccuping. I've been able to twist it around on myself with some success as well, but it takes practice. You realize you have hiccups, then slash try slash to hiccup. Actively try to make yourself do another one. It'll stop. 
If you need to de-escalate someone and get them to communicate. Asking questions about numbers slash personal information, I work in emergency services. If someone is totally distraught and shut down, asking their phone number slash address slash SSN slash birthdate can pull them out of the emotional place and bring them back to a headspace where they can talk about what happened more easily. I often ask these questions even after I have the information just to de-escalate. I work with a bunch of idiot lawyers, and I use the phrase you're correct all the time even if it's one teeny tiny thing they're correct about, it makes them feel smart, and they instantly soften, it also keeps them listening because they're hoping more flattery will come down the pike evil cackle. Mystery of Stuff